If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, please remember all our missionaries, sometimes I fail to mention them like I should, but uh, where they're laboring this morning, you remember our missionaries as well. Ephesians chapter 1, I mean, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 1, Ephesians chapter 4, the verse, the first verse, the Bible says, I therefore, the, uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye should walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now when he ascended, what is it but he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that ye might fit, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. We thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord, for what it means to us, how it keeps us grounded in a very, very difficult time, Lord. We praise you for that. God, we pray this morning that you would bless your word to our hearts, Lord, that you would stir us up by your spirit and that you would use us uh, in a way that would be well-pleasing to you. God, help us today. Meet with us is our request. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and in the first chapter, he kind of clarifies the, the specificness of election. And in the second chapter, he reminds us of our responsibility even though it's all of grace, our responsibility to preach the gospel. And now in chapter 4, he begins to talk to them about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, that is almost a taboo thing among Baptists because they're afraid that we will get into Pentecostalism. But I want you to know there are specific gifts of the Spirit for certain individuals and it's your responsibility to use them accordingly. And that is what we are to do. So it begins, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now, a lot of people will say it was because he was writing from a prison cell, and I don't believe that. He may have been in prison by that point. I don't know. But to be useful first, you have to be a prisoner of Christ. And when you are a prisoner, you do what the warden says, when the warden says it, and how the warden wants it done. That is being a prisoner unto Christ. In other words, your own volition is gone. You don't have the right to say no. And you do not have the right to say, I want it done this way because you're a prisoner unto Christ. Now, how you become a prisoner is salvation. You know why people walk in rebellion? Because they're not a prisoner. You know why people come up with false doctrines? Because they're not a prisoner. They're not being obedient to what the master says. And the only thing I can come to that, it's one of two ways. They're either never been 
uh, saved, they're not a prisoner, or they're living a very extremely rebellious life. And so Paul says, that's my position, and that's why I can do this, and that's why I can advise you to do it, is because I am a prisoner. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. Now, this is not a, this is not a uh, specific vocation yet, but he was saying you need to walk worthy as a Christian. You need to be identifiable as a believer. You need to stand out in the crowd and look different and act different and present different than the average. That's everybody's singular vocation. Now, we all have gifts, but the, the vocation is are you a Christian or not? Have you been born again or are you faking it? Have you been saved genuinely or truly? And if you have, your vocation is Christian. That, that comes first. You've been born again, you are a Christian. You know, it kind of makes me cringe a little bit when I think about the first Christian churches and the churches of Christ. What they really are are Campbellites and having taken that name from us. You know, uh, we used to just be known as Christians. Uh, Baptist is fine, kind of a newer thing that we adopted to define what we believe, but Christians uh, uh, was really the first nomination, uh, the first denomination. They were called Christians first at Antioch. And, and so we find that that is our vocation. We are Christians. We are to be defined by him. Then he says, with all lowliness. Now, have you ever thought about what, what interferes with your walk with the Lord? That's it. Your lowliness. See, we want to be in control, don't we? We want to be top dog. That is the nature of the flesh. Why did Adam do what he did? Why did Eve do what she did? She wanted to be in control. Why did Cain slew, slay Abel? Because he wanted control. He was just as good as anybody else. His decision was just as right as Abel's. So he begins in, with your with your following of the Lord, with your uh, taking on the vocation of a Christian, where you're assuming that role, you better do it with lowliness. Now, the best thing that I can give you advice with lowliness, remember wherein he brought you from. You remember that he saved you. You, you know what the most dangerous thing of Armenian doctrine and thinking you can uh, agree to salvation is it makes you in control. That, that, that's the biggest danger. And you know what? When you do that, you lose the sweetness of salvation and that it was completely offered by God. You know what it does? It takes you, you from the servant and puts you as, as the role of the master. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to remember our position and where we're at. Remember, he, uh, he, I think it was to the church at Corinthians, he, re, he said, remember from which you came. You remember what you were before the Lord saved you. And so we find that we are to be obedient. With all lowliness and meekness, very similar words, with long-suffering. Now, you ask yourself, because I don't know as well as you do, how much suffering have you had for the name of Christ? How much suffering have you, uh, have you experienced for the name of Jesus? Now, I would have to say here, here in Tennessee, we don't have that. You can, it's very hard pressed for you to find a lost person in Stewart County, although they, the majority act like it. But uh, in other situations, in other countries, listen, it's not that well. And in, others, in other places, uh, it's a mockery to name the name of Jesus. In, in, in other places, it's an embarrassment 
to even to be identified with that crowd. And, and you know, the, the end result is, is long suffering. You know, there are many, many people from the time the Lord saves them, if they live into the 80th and 90th year, a lot of a good example many people use is Polycarp. 86 years he lived a Christian, and he said, I will not deny him now. See, that, that's the kind of misery we don't understand. And so to give them understanding and to give them knowledge, he says, uh, he says you, uh, you, you, you endure these things, you bear these things. And then he says, forbearing one another in love. Now, you think about love and, you know, uh, what in the modern day, what we've equated that to is lust. And they are two very different things. Love is intrinsic. Love will keep you together. You know why there's so much divorce today? People don't love each other. They made that move without, without love and thinking about other things. Love over the years will draw you closer and closer together, not further apart. Think about your children. Uh, that love for a child is just natural. Well, I thought it was. Uh, I think uh, today we've gone on. You know why there's so much of child abuse? And I've thought this out lately in our world today. It's not because just the depravity of man. Listen, when you walk into an abortion clinic and have it cut out, what are you going to think of children? Right. They're disposable, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's the modern day. And, and so we find then that if we are to follow Christ and we are to be the servant and this is to be our vocation, all that other, all what we just understood is to be, uh, be endured. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, listen, the unity of the Spirit, you can say yay or you can say nay, but there's not one of us under the sound of my preaching voice this morning that is always kept straight line in the unity of the Spirit. You can't lose your salvation, but you sure can use, lose the unity. And that is what Paul is advising these Christian believers say, you keep it at all costs. When difficulty comes in, you love each other. You stand true. You, because you know what? The devil dearly loves to see one more church close. One more standing for the truth with the door and Ichabod wrote across it, he dances his dance. And, and so we find that we need to work on that. He makes the church in Ephesus responsible for their own unity, and we are. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Again, peace in the churches, peace within yourself, peace with your brother and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep the peace. There is one body. Now, a lot of people would take this out of its text and try to teach a universal church. But, who's he talking to? Is it a general epistle? No. He's writing to the church at Ephesus, a one-body group. So this is one body. The people here, the believers in the New Testament, we are one individual body, and we are responsible to keep the unity. And if we develop, and you know, I, I, down through the years, listen, it's, it, it's been a long haul, and not necessarily just here at New Testament, but at other churches I've preached at, at the church at Bumpus Mill. Listen, the unity wasn't always there, Right? And what happened? Right? Don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out, does it? The unity of the Spirit is critical if a church is to stand in the age which we live. The unity is absolutely paramount. And so he says there is one body and one Spirit. Capital S Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And so... What does that have to do with unity? Well, 
This is it. He will lead us in the same direction. He ain't going to have this side believing in, in, in free will and this side over here believing in God's sovereign grace. And he won't leave you, he won't lead a body in both directions. He won't, he won't leave uh, this side in living and doing as you please and blame it on God's wonderful grace and leave this side saying, hey, we need to follow what the Bible teaches. He won't do that. There must be a unity. So when there is a, sh a schism, and I believe that Paul wrote to one church about that, and maybe it was the second time to Corinth. What does it come? What what is really compromised? The unity. That's what's compromised. Being on uh, singing the same song, being in unity one with the other. There is one body. One spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. So it compares it back to the calling of God, to the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ, the calling of the Holy Ghost, you under uh, of you under salvation. There's just one calling. You want a verse of security of the believer? There it is, one calling, not multiple callings, not many times. One calling. Now, the calling has different presentations. You can look at Lydia, the seller of purple, or you can look at Paul on the Damascus Road, and there's many, many other examples where they are called, but it's one calling. In other words, he's not going to wonderfully and miraculously call, call one unto salvation and let another one say the sinner's prayer. You see what I'm saying? It's consistent. It's one. And, and you know what? I believe when you get a group of believers together on that, you've got a strong church. You, you, you've got a church that will stand for something. And, and so he, he makes it very clear, if you want to serve him, this is the terms. One calling. In other words, don't you accept another way. If a different uh, person came in here and we'll just say Catholic for for sake of name and uh, they're they're depending on the hope that's a different call is it not that that that's a different uh, that's a different thing and so certainly we wouldn't take that in now then he says one Lord and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, one Lord, one faith, uh, one set of truths. There's not multiple ways. It's not a wagon wheel and there's spokes and we're all headed in the same way. No, no, one faith. And so that comes down to this. Not everybody can be right. Uh, it's either a baptismal regeneration or it's not. And it's not. It's either a general church or it's a specific church. And it's, it both can't be true. Right. And, and we live in a day and age where everybody wants everything to be true. And that's been about 50 years now. And you know what it's led to? It's led outside the Christian realm. And you're talking about people that are supposed Christian that says Muslim is okay. Uh, worshiping nature itself is okay. And Christian is okay. That's where that line of thought will take you. And, and, and so we find then that it has to be very specific. It has to be one. And that's not popular teaching today. But as we can see, it is what the Bible says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. In other words, there's not multiple ways to do that. Immersion. One, one way. One way that that is accomplished. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. God the Father, the, the Lord God, Jehovah, Yahweh, God only. We cannot worship anything less 
than a sovereign God. Not a God that's hoping something might occur, but listen, a God that has everything under his feet and he doeth all things well. That's the God of the Bible. That's the one I'm going to serve. And he says, anything less is not God. But unto every one of you, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Then he begins to switch gears, so to speak, and he says, yes, all these are in compromisable. You can't say that there's many faiths and the Lord give me this new thing, such as uh, John, uh, as John Smith did with the Mormons. No, no. But he says you can have a different gift. Now, everybody in the sound of my voice knows I can't sing. I've accepted that that's not my gift. But I do know what the Word of God teaches about some things. And so I better use it or lose it, right? Mm -hmm. And I've known people that lost it. You see what I'm saying? Just because they kept it hid. So if you have a gift, my advice unto you is to use it, whatever it is, whatever it may be. It may not be preaching. It may not be singing. It may simply be telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ and knocking on some doors and saying, hey, this is what he's done for me. For unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, if you write in your Bible, I want you to do one thing for me. Every one. That means there's no exemptions. That, that, doesn't, that means that, oh, well, I don't have nothing to do. Because if God says every one, then it has to be all inclusive, right? It has to be exactly that, every one. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, he's referring back, I believe, when he went to Abraham's bosom. And he spent those 40 days here on earth. And he says, I give it to all men. Not just to the living Christians at that time. I give it to all men. And I never like to con correct the King James Bible. And I'm not correcting it. I'm just showing you what that, that inclusive term. It's not males. It's people. It's the church. It's the say. I gave gifts to all of you, every last one of you. And, and so, uh, ladies, we, you, the only thing I can tell you to do is look within you, look at yourself, look at how God created you individually, and use what you have. And, and I'll just give you uh, an example. I think it was Philip. It says that Philip had four daughters that did prophesy. Now, we know, uh, according to the Word of God, they weren't preaching down at the assembly, so prophesy, and let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you how the Holy Ghost came by and made those words real to me. Finally, after years and years and years of hearing the preached Word of God, He opened my heart and made me new. That's prophesying. Apparently, apparently Philip's daughter started to do so. And, and, and they told people about the goodness of God. And, and so we find then each and every one of us have been gifted. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip verses 9 and 10. If, you know they're, if you'll notice, they're in parenthesis. And apparently there had been individuals doubting that he went into Abraham's bosom and led captivity captive. And so he was kept clarifying that to the church at Ephesus. And there's still a lot of people that don't believe that. And, and, and so we see that he makes that very clear. He kind of kind of goes on the side there a minute. Then he comes back in verse 11 and gets back to gifts. And he gave some apostles. Now, the apostolic office was specific. It had specific criterion given us into Acts chapter 1, and nobody meets the 
uh, the qualifiers for the apostolic office anymore because no one can say, hey, I've seen Jesus in the flesh. The only one that didn't meet that qualifier, God made him qualified on the road to Damascus and he saw the Lord Jesus in the flesh. And because he saw the Lord Jesus in the flesh, now he was qualified and his name was Paul. Now, that doesn't happen anymore, but these men, in addition to being qualified, they had amazing acts. They could heal the sick. They could go about and pick up snakes and look at them in the eye. And really, you know, uh, I, I'm glad I'm not an apostle. I, I'm glad I don't. I, I didn't have the gift to do that. But you, have you ever thought, why would they handle snakes? And you know, snake handling churches today, I'm like, why would they do that? Well, it's a type of having victory over sin. Because the serpent was tied in a manifestation of sin. And the apostles could jerk them up and say, hey, I have, I, have, I have authority over this. I am no longer lost. I am a saved man. And they had that ability. They could take people like Joey and, and, and make them rise or run again. That was the apostolic office. And it's gone. But there was a great deal of qualifiers. And there was a great deal of gifts that came with it. And we no longer in the modern day can can even look into that office except with admiration and learn from the teaching of the Word of God what the apostolic office was about, but we do know that it, exist, it existed. And some prophets, now I believe personally here, and, and you, can, uh, you can disagree with me if you want, I don't believe this is prophets so like saying, oh, I believe the Lord will come on December the 6th, 2021. Don't know. Prophets meaning people like Zechariah, people like Job, people like Malachi. They had very special gifts, did they not? Look at the prophecy of Daniel. That was an amazing, amazing prophecy. And some of it still not come to pass. And he had the, he had the built-in, God-given, intrinsic knowledge to predict things that that still have not come to pass in the day which we live. That's what he was granted. That was his gift. That is the prophet. Now, let, let me say this. And there was a, a, a Mormon that befriended me on Facebook. And man, they think they've got the world by the tail, don't they? And uh, I said, uh, well, uh, I said, uh, asking some questions about the Book of Mormon, and I ended with a, with a scripture. I said, has it not been changed in its entirety nine times? I said, did not Joseph Smith, the only one that ever really saw it, did he not say he understood a language that he had never seen before? Did he not burn up the supposed tablets before anybody else could see him? And I said, what about this one? He, I said, in the Book of the Revelation, it said, Nothing should be added. And he said, oh yeah, that's different and unfriended me. <laughs> right? Don't have much place to go with that, does he? You know what? Joseph Smith was not a prophet. No. Not in any way whatsoever. And, and, and so we find then that he says, <laughs> he, he, he says, these people were equipped to the part of the the apostles, the prophets were equipped and had a specific office, and some evangelists. Now, I have met uh, many evangelists, and this is just my own opinion, and, and, and y'all can say what you will. I, I would probably say Brother Downs had a gift for this office. Uh, uh, now, he was my pastor, too, and I enjoyed that, but I'll have to really say, just to be bluntly honest, I think he made a better evangelist. I think he did a better job telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he did a wonderful job as expository on the goodness of God's grace. He did an amazing job on that. That is an evangelist. Listen, it's not Billy Graham. You know what an evangelist will do? They'll, they'll, they'll spread the gospel and leave it there. They won't beg nobody to do nothing. They'll point to the Lord Jesus Christ and His sufficiency of sin, and they'll leave it there. That, that is the work of an evangelist. And you know what? They'll go after it. 
If, if all they have is a tent by the side of the road, a person who is an evangelist will do this work. Not everybody's equipped to do it. That's the difference in, in these gifts that the Apostle Paul is writing about. Some people just can't do that. Uh, I'd love to have a tent meeting in Carlisle. On the problem is, I've, I've lived down there and the mosquitoes will carry you away. But uh, they're, they're cleaning a lot off by the creek. And when I was down there yesterday, man, I got excited. I was like, man, that's the place to do it. Uh, not everybody's bent that way. Now, I don't know about Brother Jared. He might love evangelism too. But he, uh, he might go by there and say, well, thank God I don't live here. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a God-given gift. And either you have it or not. And so the Apostle Paul was encouraging the people of Ephesus, listen, use what you have, recognize it, and use it for the glory of God. And some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers and these teachers are gifted. They understand the Word of God. But you know what? This is what I have found. Very few teachers are preachers. Now, I can teach the Word a little of God a little bit, but you know what? That's just not the office I was given, and I'm okay with that. Have you ever saw anybody who wants to run a, a one-man show? They want to be the song leader. They want to be the Sunday school teacher. They want to be the preacher. They want to be the treasurer. And all the above. You know what? I don't believe people are gifted that way. Do you? And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, what, what we should ought to be content to do is find out where our gift is, what our gift, God-given gift is, and then, and then use it for the glory of God. Now, the reason why for the perfecting or the completing or the nurturing for the perfecting of the saints. Now, if you're out there to do it for yourself, you fall flat on your face and you should. Because it's for the nurturing and the maturing of the saints. You use your office, if it's nothing but washing the dishes downstairs, you wash it for the glory of God. And so the saints don't get sick the next time they were eat out of the same pan. You see what I'm saying? That we're not doing it to be the big guy on campus. And man, I've seen a lot of that in my life. And you know what I found with most of them? They're not even around anymore kind of gives credence to the Word of God, don't it? And, and, and so we find that whatever office we fit in, be sure your motivation is the glorifying of the Lord Jesus Christ for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ or the church. That's what we are to be uh, focused on, that is what we are to do. Now, very quickly, I want to look at an apostle that did most of this, and I will probably end up not getting to everything, but I, I, I do want to, I do want to just point, point out, and that is the apostle John. John chapter 4, I mean, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 20, Gospel of Matthew chapter uh, number 4, in verse 20, the Bible says, And straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Now, I want you to see the reason I pointed this out. If you're going to be useful, whether it's a dishwasher or a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing is the willing spirit to leave it all behind. Getting out of that comfort zone. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes he's going to push you to this. And you know what? You should welcome it with joy. 
Listen, I, I, I never even, I, I lived outside of Stewart County for about five years, and that's the only time I've ever even not had a Stewart County address. But if he says, you need to go to South America, the best thing I do is get my youngins together and head out. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and he's not going to let you, you know, you follow all those that follow Jesus. And, add, and answer me this, how many stay in one place a long, such a long time? Uh, I, I'll go even, even further than that. And how... How are you going to use a circle of influence that is so small? We, we, we need to get out and we need to be a witness and we need to be, listen, you don't have to go to Arabia, but listen, you can go, you can go outside the comfort zone and speak the name of Jesus. So an effectual call, even for the ministry, is absolutely necessary. Matthew 10, Matthew 10, in the first verse, the Bible says this, and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Now, I'll give you two, two items of thought for this. And the first one is, we know sovereignly God knew who these 12 men would be, including Judas, who was a devil. But on the flip side, what do you think the Lord Jesus Christ looked at to say, these are my 12? Listen, I don't think there was ever a time when Peter said, I'm too good to do that. I don't think there was ever a time where he says, you cook the fish yourself. I'm busy tonight. I don't think there was ever a time where John said, you know what? I'm sick of leaning on your breast and getting advice. And you're talking about a 15-year-old boy. You see what I'm saying? Did you wanna did you wanna lean on Jesus' breast when you were 15? Now you may be cut from the different stuff than I am, and I, but I was a saved man, and that's the farthest thing from my mind. So I believe these apostolic people <laughs> they didn't get there by, by sitting around and doing nothing. I believe that they were God given. So John wanted this for himself. The Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 17. Matthew 17 in the first verse. And after six days, Jesus taketh up Peter, James, and John, his brother, <laughs> and bringeth them up into a mountain, a high mountain apart. Now, I just want to throw this out here and give you Bible study for this week. Who's missing? Peter, James, and John. Who's the other one that was in that first four group that's named as an apostle? Andrew. So what's the change? What was different now? Why was he no longer? Well, I, I have to come to this conclusion. For some reason, he wasn't fully in. He wasn't following the Lord as closely as the others because the Lord Jesus, in his understanding and his knowledge of them, he picked those three and left the fourth one and the other seven uh, out of the mix. You see what I'm saying? Something was different. And I don't think he got picked just because he was an everyday apostle and he beheld this thing and the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ in a wonderful, wonderful way. I'm going to read one more verse for you. Mark chapter 3. And I do just want to point out this was before the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ on the mount. And... Again, something happened in there. I don't know why. But we have the two refer to something that's different. Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. 
And James, the son of Zebedee, again, naming the apostles. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whose surname is Bulgarianus, which is the son, the sons of thunder. So here we, here we find their name, the sons of thunder. Now I think I got my brothers mixed up there, but I just want to point out to you that you don't get called a son of thunder, and that's what Jesus called them. That wasn't the the word the word of the land. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we had a good storm last night. Lots and lots of thunder. What does thunder do? First of all, it's a reaction or the manifestation of light, right? It, it always follows light. You hear the you see the flash of light, and then you hear the, the rumbling of thunder. You know what thunder does? It gets your attention. You can't ignore it. I know one, one rumble of thunder, and it don't take much at our house, you know, despite what it is, the, in the skeleton, it's still a trailer, right? And I could hear in the, in the bathroom next to my bed, stuff shaking. And it got my attention. So, I ask you this. How did they get that name? They were doing their job. They were just simply doing what God called them to do. So I ask you this, what is your job? What is your gift? Are you doing it and doing it effectively? Are you, are you being faithful to the office that He's given you? And if you're not, uh, my advice would be that you do that.